Bad news for America. Cowboys won a playoff game. Good news for America. We get to watch them attempt more extra points. Woohoo! Run it back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up, run it back. Yeah. Good morning. Good Happy back. Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. It, it is Tuesday. Yes, it is. This is Run It Back. And I'd like to introduce everyone to the gentleman, as always, Stadium Insider, Sham Sharania. And the, the rating of the backgrounds is getting it's getting worse. Uh, Chandler, <laughs> but he's got extra light and Eddie's got a new vibe going. You're on the West Coast. I understand it. I, I am. I'm right, right, right around Chandler's neighborhood, apparently. Stalking wow. him. <laughs> he's right outside. OK, this is good. I expect some. uh I expect some drinking to happen tonight at some point. All right, guys, oh, sure. we got to get right back. There was a nice, uh, a nice full docket of games yesterday. It was like a good day because they were all day. But Jason Tatum with 51. Here's the MVP chance in Charlotte. Now has the most 50 point games in Celtics history, but he's only the fourth favorite right now in that MVP race on FanDuel Sportsbook. So I ask you, Chandler, what if anything would need to happen for him to overtake Jokic at this point? Uh, it, it's tough. Honestly, it's Jokic, like we said yesterday, he's kind of pulling away with it, which it's it's Tatum's having such a good year. This dude's averaging 31, 8, and 4. It's pretty efficient, shooting 47% from the field, 35 from three. And they have a nice cushion there as the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. They've been the most consistent, best team all year long. Uh, it's just Jokic, the, the, the way he's doing it, the, the triple doubles, uh, it, it's tough because there's four guys right now that could easily win it in my book. And for, for whatever reason, just the way Jokic is doing, the way he's playing these huge eruption of games he's having, uh, it, it's just, I think he's pulled away with it, but I don't know, maybe, uh, the, the nuggets take a slide here. They stop winning games. Jokic gets hurt, misses time. It's going to have to take something because right now Jokic's run away with it, but Tatum games like this, can only help. And and again, they're the best team. They've been the most consistent team and he's the best player on the best team. So he should, <laughs> I think he should be higher than the fourth, to be honest Agreed. with you, but I think he should probably be second, but uh, more games like this and more wins for them will kind of translate to him just kind of staying in the hunt and staying on, on, on Jokic's tail. Yeah, he's, he's got an uphill battle as far as the MVP goes. You know, Jokic, as I said yesterday, he's kind of has the narrative going. Jason Tatum's an interesting player. I was wondering about him last year about how could he win an MVP? You know, the, the MVP is several formulas. He's, he's, he's either going to have gaudy stats or win a ton of games and have really good stats. Well, he has that now, but unfortunately, even 31 points a game, he's third in the league in scoring. There's two guys ahead <laughs> of him. He, even having great stats and being first in his conference, the other guy he's dealing with has gaudy stats and he's first in his conference. So it's an uphill battle. I mean, it might take some injuries. Who knows? Um, he's having a great season. He's being recognized for having a great season, but there's MVP candidates that started the season ready to make that leap and did. And it's just unfortunate for him. They did it at the same time as him. I think the one way Jason Tatum can have a more bigger say in the MVP conversation, more games like last night. Like we've seen Nikola Jokic have marquee games. Yes, Jason Tatum has had those big games as well and has him, uh, you know, with, with the Celtics number one firmly all season long. But I think you saw him last night. Like he had a chance to just have 40 and he goes for 50. And I think that cemented him as, as another 50 point player in the, in the NBA this year. I think having more performances like that. But yeah, I mean, it would probably take a Denver Nuggets slide at some point uh, during in the second half of the year and, and for Boston to maintain their number one seed because other than that what Nikola Jokic is doing right now with that team number one it's easy to say yes he's won it twice in a row it's hard to give him a third time but he's making it increasingly difficult to look past him uh, in Denver I do think Tatum being fourth on that list is probably more of a sticking point at this point he should be higher on that but he did talk about going for 50 specifically last night uh, and here's what he mentioned, that he had talked to Jamal Crawford. He texted me after the Heat game. He's like, if you're ever that close to 50, nobody's going to remember the time and score. They're just going to report if you got 50 or not. And that's what was going through my mind. Jamal telling me, if you get that close to 50, go get it. Uh, he shot a three. They were 30 seconds, 38 seconds, really. And they were up 13. <laughs> Chandler, do you have any issues with him going for that 50? Uh, I don't, honestly. Jamal's <laughs> right. Uh, Jamal is completely right that, you know, obviously he... Still had a great game regardless, but 50 is is kind of a headline 
number and nobody's going to remember how no one's going to remember that shot a couple of weeks from now, a couple of days from now, maybe the Hornets, the next time they play him, if they were any good and there was a rival, this would be an issue. Uh, <laughs> but in a game like last night where he's on the road, he's getting MVP chance in their building. They're not yeah. a good team. This was the perfect game for him to do something like this. But yeah, if you're doing this against Milwaukee or you're doing this against Brooklyn, you're going to have to see them in the, in the playoffs, a shot like this could be personal and could be offensive, but a game like this uh, where, where it's such an uphill battle, like we just talked about for him to be in this MVP talk, he needs to get 50 balls like this for that resume. And, and he did it. Yeah. I think you guys are right. He needs these type of games. He needs these signature moments to kind of build up his narrative, his story, his claim for the MVP. And I'm with Chandler. I'm a, I'm a stat chaser. I, I don't care. I'm, I'm captain of the stat chaser team. If you're close to 60, stay in the game. I don't care how much you're up. Uh, you know, not Ricky Davis quite throw the rebound off the backboard stat chasing, not book the way he got his 70 and they're fouling they're down 17 and they're trying to just hemorrhage points. Mm -hmm. But yo, if you're close, if you're there, if you're in the game, and, and, and that number's inside. You see guys do this all the time. They're looking up at that scoreboard. They're trying to figure out how close they are to their triple-double, to their double-double, to 40, to 50, to 60. Go get go get it. It's fine. And then like Chandler said, it's not like the Hornets can do anything about it. They, they got to they gotta just accept it. Hey, let me tell you, players, players during the game always know how many points they have. They always know how many rebounds. They always know if they're close to a double-double, triple-double, whatever. So whenever they say they don't, they're lying. Are you telling me that they're lying a lot, Chandler? I feel like that's what you're saying. I get it. I totally get it. Look, on the Hornet side, I know we've thrown a lot of shade at them. They have lost five straight. They do have pieces, though, Shams. And Michael Jordan still is in that building somehow, some way in spirit. So what? what's the deal? What direction is this team headed? They're a clear rebuilding team. I mean, when you look at their record, they've been without Miles Bridges all season long. They've had extended injuries. LaMelo Ball's missed a lot of time. Dennis Smith Jr. has missed a lot of time. Gordon Hayward has missed a lot of time. They've just dealt with an onslaught. Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong for this team. They've got the worst record in the Eastern Conference, the second worst record in the league. And I think as you move toward the deadline coming up in less than one month, uh, teams are expecting the Hornets to listen in on a lot of their key players. Terry Rozier, I'm told, is going to be a guy that the Hornets will listen on conversations about. Can you get young players and picks for a guy like that? And then when you look at expiring contracts or guys nearing the end of their deals, Jalen McDaniels, Mason Plumley, Kelly Oubre Jr., uh, Gordon Hayward, of course, I think they're going to be open-minded with all those guys and seeing if there's a market, if there's interest for those players, uh, some of which are on expiring deals. But look for the Hornets to really move toward a rebuild in the second half of the year. Uh, and, and, you know, there's going to be playoff teams that are going to have a level of interest in some of these guys. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not they're not a good team, but they do have pieces and they do have assets. Like if I'm a contender or if I'm a team that's in the hunt, I'm looking at this roster and they have pieces that can really help a good team. Uh, but they're a ways away. But you know what? This season could all be washed if they get that number one pick with, with, with Victor and kind of start to rebuild fresh there with him moving forward with with LaMelo and with guys like that. Uh, that, that could be interesting. But yeah, they're they're plummeting and they're plummeting fast and it's kind of number one pick or bust. That's a big gamble. Uh, Steph Curry warriors. It, this is a, it's a weird turn of events when we're talking about the warriors and this being a big win. Uh, so he had 41 yesterday, the matinee they're five and 17 on the road now. And Kerr's the guy that said, it. he said, it is a big win when you're 500. Every win is a big win. Um, look, we all know what the Warriors' struggles have been so far, but man, eight games under 500, that's what the Wizards are, and they're calling it a big win. Where are we with this team, Eddie? How is this even possible to say this? I mean, Steve Kerr is right, and he's sending a message to his team, and he's kind of poking the bear a little bit because he knows they have to be frustrated as well. I think for them, it, it is a big win, not because they beat the Wizards, but to see Steph look like this again. I, I think his first two games, he was a little passive, and people were wondering, Yo, is the shoulder still hurt a little bit or is he just, you know, catching up, got a little rust. Uh, but to see him attacking the way he did, it, it was it was encouraging. When you have your best player looking like the best player in the world, that makes you feel like you can win every single game. Um, it is kind of a funny quote on the state of the team and, and where they're at. But I mean, that's reality right now. They're a 500 team and they've played like it. They've been inconsistent. They've been lackadaisical. They've, they had a failure for attention to detail. And they've been flawed all season long. And, you know, maybe this is the beginning of a turn. 
they're one of those teams who can hit the switch and have hit the switch. And it's frustrating, I guess, as a fan. And it sounds like it's frustrating as a coach as well. <laughs> um, but this is where they're at. And, and this is what they're going to have to snap out of. They really don't have a choice. Yeah. When, when you're struggling like this, especially on the road for this team, every win is a big win and they need every win going forward. And and you're right, Eddie, Steph showing games like this after the injury is huge. Jordan Poole having games like this at the same time as Steph Curry is huge. Draymond Green played really, really well last night. He had 17, 10 and six or something. He, he was scoring. He was knocking down his free throws. He made two threes. This is the kind of attack and, and recipe that they have to have. Um, especially when Wiggins is getting his legs back. Clay is out. Uh, this is a team that's not concerned. They don't care who they play in the first round that they think they can beat anybody. And I don't doubt them. I think they are a team that can flip the switch and they're a tough matchup nightmare for pretty much anybody in the Western conference. So yeah, just to, just to be able to get a win like this and have your best player play at the level he did last night was huge. Yeah. I don't know if the flip the switch thing is something the Warriors can just get used to. Chandler made a great point right there. I think that's really what this team is starting to do though. You know, like, and it might just be a dog days of the season type thing. Yes. They've got all their guys back, but when I saw them the other night uh, in Chicago, you can kind of see it, it came in ebbs and flows. And yesterday in D.C., there was a fan joining with Draymond Green during the game. And you just saw the energy level of Draymond Green and that Warriors team shift. So I don't know if they need a fan in the audience every night kind of joining with them, motivating them. Four championships in, what, nine, ten years that they've been going here, or not eight years during this run. Like, it's exhausting. It takes a lot of mental fortitude on a nightly basis. So maybe this team just needs motivation on a nightly basis because second half of the game last night, when, when that fan was at Draymond Green, he had a stellar half. The team won going away, and I think uh, you know, it was a big win for the Warriors. I think now 2-10 and ten against the East uh, on the road. And apparently it was sort of that good fun heckling. Like Draymond didn't have the dude thrown out. So that's nice. Got some growth going on on the parts of both sides. Uh, Jordan Poole with 32 and seven last night, right now on the FanDuel Sportsbook site. He's he's second for sixth man, right behind Russell Westbrook, Eddie. So right now, who are you picking between those two? I'm picking Jordan Poole. I think it's kind of crazy to me that those are the top two guys. I think, you know, I would really want to see Matherin win the award, but uh, you know, he's going to be better now that now that Stephen Curry is back. He's going to be better now that he slotted it back in that six man role. And he also has a nice uh, stats boost from those games he started. But <laughs> I, I'm going him over Russ. But uh, look, we, we ba bash Russ all the time and, and everybody is he's trying to mm -hmm. trade him and all that. He's had a good season. He's had a really good season. I, I know he lost the game the other night. If you watch, he clearly got grabbed by Joel Embiid. I know the NBA said it wasn't a foul. It was something. But uh, yeah, as far as if these are the guys, I'm going to pick Jordan Poole. I think he's just going to have better opportunity. Yeah, I think he's going to have bigger games like this. He's going to have better numbers. I just, he started half the games, right? So I don't know what the, the how do you, how do you justify that? If, if Clay's in and out of the lineup, if Steph misses more time, he's going to start, which would be the only reason I don't think he runs away with, with this award. But yeah, I like Russ just because of kind of everything he's done, how much he's been just shit on in the media and how much he's been kind of just dragged. And ever since they made that move to, for him to the bench, I don't know what switch, but he has been aggressive. He has been playing confident and he has been producing. So they could go either way. I'm with Eddie. I love Mather. I think he's an absolute stud, um, but you could really go either way with these guys. Yeah, it's crazy. He's not even on that the ticker, the, the graphic. Um, guys, let's go west, shall we, to the Crypto.com arena. A very heartwarming moment last night shared between an old man and a young man. Here it is. You played against my dad, first your first NBA game ever, really. Sacramento. Why you, do that to you feel old, don't you? Um, uh, it's the you feel old, don't you, that really kills me. Look, LeBron went on to score 48 against Houston. Lakers snap in their three-game losing streak. He said afterwards that he was extremely exhausted, really tired, his body sore, that he should could have taken the night off, but uh, they can't really have him taking the night off, sadly. The fact that LeBron can't take the night off and needs 48 against the Houston Rockets team, Chandler, says what? 
that they're not very good. And, 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 he's <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> yeah. And, and, he's, and he's, he's right. Also, I don't like that he's saying he's extremely tired. We all know what he's doing. We all know yeah, that he's yeah. tired. You can't have a game like this and then go and say that you almost didn't play. Like, I, I don't love that. But listen, he had an unbelievable game last night. The way he was scoring, the things, the way he's producing at this stage of his career and this age really, really is remarkable. But yeah, you're looking at a completely tanking, horrific team in the Rockets that are so young that aren't even trying to win games. And no doubt in my mind, if LeBron did sit this game, the Rockets win that game. So. <laughs> This is just where they are, but at the end of the day, look, this was a win, and this kind of keeps them right there in the thick of things to try and squeeze in that last spot. And this is what they are. They are who they are at this point. They're not a great team. They need to get Anthony Davis healthy. They need to get a lot of their guys healthy. But these are the these are the type of games that LeBron unfortunately has to have in year 20 for them to even have a chance at beating the arguably the worst team in the NBA. I, I get LeBron's comment and I get the concern over his minutes. Yes. You don't want him to play 35 plus minutes on back to back days, but he clearly can do it. And I'm kind of with Chandler. Like, yo, you don't have to tell us that it was tough. You had to play back to back. Of course you he are does. pro. You are the goat. You clearly could do it. You went out there and almost dropped 50 on these young boys. So, I mean, look, it, they need that. They need it. At the end of the day, they need it. He knows they need it. That's why he was out there. It's pretty much what he said. I do like the moment with Jabari. I do think it's funny. It kind of reminds me <laughs> of like being around my my son's friends and just like, yo, I think I'm cool until I'm around a bunch of 16 year olds and I'm actually just an old goober. But I, I the, my favorite part is that he's not mic'd up. So that was probably about as natural as we're ever going to get to hear LeBron. And he was just like, why you tell me that, man? Like, why? <laughs> I feel LeBron. Everybody in their mid to late 30s hates to be reminded that they're in their mid to late 30s. So, yeah, great moment. I don't and, think uh, that's yeah, true, though. LeBron, you can do back to backs. It's cool. Like, it's, it's, I, it's I in the contract. You can pull it off. Yeah, but Le <laughs> LeBron can't claim that because he's literally riding this I'm 38 ride all the way to the end. Like, this, I mean, we have to hear about it 24. I think during the broadcast last night, there must have been a drinking game internally because we know. He's 38. He spends a million dollars a year on his body, blah, blah, blah. Like you can't do all these things and then sit there and tell everybody that you're talking. I mean, you know, it's like taking nine jobs you don't need and then calling yourself a hero. That's weird to me, but whatever. Uh, okay. It's Shams. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I think a, a couple things. One, that moment to me is dope. Like the fact that Jabari Smith's dad is at the game and, and Jabari <laughs> Smith says that to him during the game, like awesome kudos to the Mike crew to, to find that footage and then have the dad and like, I, you know, kudos to everyone all around for that. <laughs> I think, listen, the way LeBron's played this year, though, the numbers he's putting up the last couple weeks, like 48 points. I know when he signed that two year hundred plus million dollar extension in the summer. I think part of that was we knew this Lakers team was not going to be a surefire playoff team. No doubt about it. Like this team did not look capable from a roster construction uh, standpoint to be a shoe in for the playoffs. So it's like, why did LeBron sign that extension? Well, it's like, listen, you secure some money. And at the end of the day, I think even those around the Lakers didn't exactly know how LeBron would play this season as you're going into year 20. Yes, he was going to surpass Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at some point this year. I don't know if everyone expected it would be this soon. I mean, it seems like it's only within the next 10 games or so at the pace he's at now. So I think the level LeBron's playing at now has to be a surprise to even the Lakers. And that has a lot to do with the fact that now that AD is going to be on the way back in the next few weeks, right before the All-Star break, how does that position them uh, before the trade deadline and what moves they can make? I'm glad you brought up trade deadline. Leads me to my tease because the Raptors have won four of their last five. But CJ McCollum says they're going to be sellers as we approach this trade deadline. That on Run It Back when we return. Run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back. Go for three. Yeah, but when the Raptors fouled him before, missed it. Knicks just need two. Five seconds remaining. Barrett brings it up. Barrett on the drive goes inside. of a way to send a game into overtime right there from R.J. Barrett, but Brunson's game-winning attempt off the mark. The Knicks end up losing this one to Toronto. The Raptors have won four out of five. 
They do have 10 of their next 12 out on the road. And CJ McCollum, who has a podcast, was speaking on this Raptors squad and said, there's rumblings about certain players on the team not being happy. And due to tampering, I can't speak to that. But I think they're going to move someone. That is a very spicy, spicy quote, Shams. Any insight to share on, uh, on what CJ had to say here? Well, real quick, from Chandler's perspective, like if you're a player on the Raptors, this is the MVPA <laughs> president. What, like, what? How do you feel hearing that from CJ McCollum, a guy on another team who could actually have a team that can make a trade for one of these guys? Yeah, well, if it's if it's true, then obviously I'm kind of salty that he's kind of airing it out. If, if, if you know, if he does actually know something is happening, but uh, yeah, I've never really seen something like this. Clearly, he knows something that we don't they are severely you know not playing well and underachieving this year and they do have a lot of young pieces and a lot of trade assets so uh i feel like if it smells like fish it's probably fish and there's something going on here but i, I have what? no idea i i i I don't know. This this one's weird to me. I know that the fans aren't happy. They want Nick Nurse fired. Uh, they're they're not even in the play in right now, and they have really really high expectations this year. Michelle, you didn't like that fishy comment. That's not the phrase because it could be something else. That's not. The phrase. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll break it. I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I'll break it down. I mean, I mean, the, the, the matter of the issue is, is that, yeah, the Raptors want to be competitive. They want to be a team that's making the playoffs. Like Masai Ujiri is history. This, this is a group that wants to compete and contend. And yeah, like Chandler said, they've been underwhelming this year. And that's why when you look at it, they're, they're four games under 500. They're out of the playing tournament right now. You, you look at the talent that they have on the scene. Pascal Siakam, OG Ananubi, Fred Van Vliet, Gary Trent. I think all those guys are being monitored across the league to see just exactly when Toronto could flip the switch on the season and move more toward a rebuild. You have Fred Van Vliet going into uh, the last. Uh, he's going to be a free agent in the summer. OG Ananubi next year will be in the last year of his deal. Same as Pascal Siakam. Gary Trent is also going into a free agency year. So they've got decisions to make on a lot of these guys. And you, you can't really pay all of them if you're not going to be even a playoff team. So Masai Ujiri has a lot of decisions to make. I think these next two to three weeks, if this team can turn it around, then you could see Masai Ujiri giving some, you know, some hope and some commitment to this group to try to ride it out. Because we saw last year, they got off to a rough start. They turned around second half of the year. They make it into a position where they're a four or five seed. This year, we'll see. They have a two to three week window right now where their season's going to come in, in, into form, whether they're going to sell or they're going to buy. And everyone around the league is watching. Yeah, and it's interesting because I like their team. Looking at the standings, I like them more than Chicago, Atlanta, Indy, New York. Like, they're a better team than, than they're showing right now. So that's what's confusing about them. But what's, what what happens, Shams, when, when you know, one of these guys gets traded to New Orleans? Like, is, is that right? tampering? Like, what, what happens <laughs> then? Yo, Chandler, are you calling tampering on this? Like, I don't know. This is just interesting for me. I've never seen this before either. It's not tampering because nothing's happened yet. It's not like he's, you know, he's just saying what he thinks. I don't think this is tampering. I just think maybe it's, it's almost just gossip. It's rumors at this point, but it will get interesting if one of these guys do eventually get moved <laughs> uh, and they kind of look back at this quote, especially if it's to new Orleans. That's my thing. They have 10 to 12 on the road coming up. I mean, if you're New Orleans front office, David Griffin and those guys, like, and you were planning on maybe trying to poach a couple Raptors or at least one, you must be, and look, CJ's not known to be a reckless dude. So for him to say this at all is like, oh, okay. But it is interesting because you have no idea what your own front office is maybe planning to do or not planning to do. That's when I think this gets interesting. And could anything happen to CJ? I mean, is there any punishment? I mean, what, I don't even know what you do with this. Where do you put it? There's not going to be a punishment. Like Chandler said, it's players gossiping about players. But when you look at New Orleans, they actually have assets. Like if they want to go and get serious with an OG on a newbie or a yeah. Pascal Siakam, they've got all their picks. They've got the Lakers picks. That's why when they made, you know, they're one of the teams that did call the Nets about Kevin Durant. They just didn't offer uh, fully Zion Williamson or Brandon Ingram. But they have all the picks in the world. They've got young players. So theoretically, this is a team that has what it takes to get a guy like that. Yes. See if, oh, Eddie can't hear us, but he looks 
fabulous. And that's really all that matters at this point. But we can say whatever we want about him, guys. So that's fun. Go ahead and do it now. Uh, Walker Kessler. And this is a bummer. We need him on this next topic because Walker Kessler is up, as he normally is at any point in a basketball show. Uh, 20 points, 21 rebounds, lifting the Jazz to a one-point win over the Wolves, uh, becoming the first rookie to have a 2020 game on 65% shooting since Alonzo morning Chandler not bad how impressed are you yeah I'm super impressed because he's just one of those old school bigs he's 21 years old he, he's super efficient he's long he blocks shots uh, you know he wasn't necessarily a, that high of a draft pick um he's great value and to, to kind of have this a 2020 20 game that, that, that's a huge game especially for a young guy kind of learning his way getting comfortable um he's mobile he can defend uh i, I like him a lot the guy's shooting 71 percent from the field like that he's not taking bad shots he's finishing he's dunking everything uh he's a great asset you know at that point of the draft too just going forward and uh, listen, is this guy going to be a star player? Who knows? But for what he's doing now and the way he's producing on this team where they're at, he's a fantastic pickup. Uh, we have our friends over at StatMuse. These are some; these are actual fun facts. Uh, Malik Beasley leading the league in threes off the bench. Walker Kessler leading the league in blocks off the bench. Uh, both acquired in the Rudy Gobert trade. Gobert trade, but that's not all they got. Um, they also got uh, Jared Vanderbilt and four four first round picks. Eddie, I'll go to you first. Uh, is it too soon? to call this trade a failure and perhaps maybe the worst trade in NBA history. No, <laughs> it, like I, what I, I thought you were going to ask was, is it too soon to call it the Walker Kessler trade? I, there's like a Twitter <laughs> joke that's real easy to make about Walker Kessler doing this and Rudy Gobert going out with a groin five minutes into the game, but it, mm. it's fine. The, the, the haul for Rudy Gobert, it will be ridiculed for years to come. There, he's almost no way he can play as well as that trade. So no, it's not too early to call it a failure. Yeah. The expectation, once this trade went down, Gobert would have to have a, a Jokic, you know, crazy type year to kind of justify and validate, you know, giving up all those assets and players. So yeah, right now it's, it's not looking good. I, I love Rudy Gobert. Eddie, Eddie goes at him all the time. I, I, I understand his value. I think he's just, it's, it's not the way the NBA is going, especially where they already have towns. It didn't really make sense, but he's fantastic defensively. He rebounds the ball, he blocks shots uh, just to give up that much for a guy like that, you gave him really no chance to even, you know, kind of validate that trade. Cause it, it's not like he's going to produce these crazy numbers. It's not like he's going to dominate games like that, especially offensively. So to give up that much for a guy like that didn't really make sense. And it's probably going to go down as one of the worst in, to ever happen. <laughs> Shams, any, uh, Walker, what do you think? Kessler. Yeah. Walker, Walker, I mean, Kessler. you, you, you you have to give it up to Danny Ainge. I mean, what he got for Donovan Mitchell, what he got for Rudy Gobert. I mean, when you think about the package you got from Minnesota, you get Walker Kessler, Jared Vanderbilt, Malik Beasley, two very good rotation players, two guys that are desired by other teams around the league. Walker Kessler's looking like a guy that's going to start at center for either them or any other team for the next 12 years. Um, <laughs> and then you get a boatload of picks, four first round picks. Uh, they get they get they get more first round picks for for Donovan Mitchell, and you get a franchise type cornerstone in Lowry Markkinen, and you get draft swaps, seconds, whatever it was. Like they've got everything long term moving forward. I think this is literally what Danny Ainge did a, a decade plus ago with the KG Paul Pierce trade in Boston to reboot that franchise around Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. So. You, you got to give it up uh, th like like this. This tweet is exactly, uh, you know, what, what, what I think sums up what Utah just did in the last uh, six to eight months. Danny Ainge knows what he's doing, it sounds like. That's what we agree. We're all on the same page there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, it's it's looking that way. And for a team that we, you know, we thought was going to be rebuilding and which they are, but they're still winning games. They all of a sudden have this talent and the star player and Lori Markkinen. And uh, they, they've really just put together a, a great rebuilding team. And now you can add a few other pieces and you have picks going forward. I, I love what they've done. Oh, we lost it. Eddie hates us. Goes to the West Coast, big times us the entire show. That's fine. We're going to take a quick break anyways, because coming up next, George Carl says that Michael Jordan would average a 40-point triple-double. Are we buying that? Find out. 
run it up, the running back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, 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 run it up, the running back, yeah. We had to show them. These are uh, Jason Tatum's first signature Jordan shoes. They were leaked online. Little mini fitter brick. <laughs> I don't know who wants to take this one first, but fitter brick on this. Eddie, you there? Yeah, I get why guys sign with Jordan brand. They want to get that nice shipment every two weeks of all the Jordans of all time. But <laughs> then you end up with this and it's like, yo, <laughs> is it? Are you getting your ROI there, JT? Are you getting Oof. what you need? I mean, Jordan Brand has essentially never made a great signature shoe for anybody but uh, the man whose name is on the shoes. So really that's is. the risk you take. But uh, he'll get every Jordan one that comes out for the rest of life. And uh, when I look at guys like Quentin Richardson or, or, or something like that, who have long since retired and still reap the Jordan benefits, I guess it makes sense in the long run. Yeah, you signed with Jordan to get all the Jordan his shoes, all the team, <laughs> all the team, the Mellows, the the Blake Griffins. They're they're usually pretty trash, and and these are kind of in that category. <laughs> <laughs> these, these these are not it. I really don't. Like I hate those. being that dude. I hate being that dude. But I think Jason Tatum said that the, this leak wasn't real. But you know. Yeah, I hate being that dude, but he did say that. I mean, you know, I just that's good that. news. That is good news. He hopefully, hopefully out the that, cap yeah, emoji. that's a positive. Yeah, yeah those, those are weird. That's a lot of plasticky, rubbery yuckiness on the side, but that's okay. That's okay. You still get Jordans for life. Uh, guys, we've got some of you buying that. Last night, Shaq was worked up about Ja Morant. Uh, saying, you know, his play is amazing. He's upset. All the experts talking about MVPs. You don't say John Morant's name enough. The kid can flat out play. Um, yeah, we. I mean, we don't. We don't mention him really at all, Chandler. Are you buying that he deserves a little more MVP shine? I mean, yeah, he definitely does, and he's having a great year. He's just kind of in that similar boat as Tatum where, where the thing Jokic, uh, you know, is doing are just a little bit more special and a little bit more impressive, but yeah, the way that he's, I think they're tied right now with Denver for the number one seed. And they have that cushion on the three and four seeds. Uh, and with his second and third best player, Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson being in and out of the lineup and him basically carrying the load with guys like Dylan Brooks and other guys on that team, for them to be in the position they are right now it is huge. And there's no doubt his value to this team. There's no doubt he's one of the most exciting players to, to, to play in the league right now. And uh, yeah, he, he definitely deserves more shine. It's just, he's, he's up against other guys right now that are having, you know, great, if not better seasons than him. Yeah, he, he definitely deserves to be higher. There's no doubt about that. Now, it's just tough with, with him because the Grizzlies, yes, they've won 10 in a row. They look amazing right now. They look like a well-oiled machine. They were they were a top two seed last year. So it's tough unless, unless Memphis somehow was a runaway at number one and just totally destroying the league. You can make a case that he is your MVP this year. But the fact that Denver's won, Jason Tatum's balled out in the Eastern Conference as well. Uh, but he, he deserves to be high on, on the list for sure behind those two guys. Yeah, when, when Shaq says this, I wonder in what sense. Should, should he get, like, some low-level votes? I, I guess, you know, but he, he's not the MVP right now. We know he's not the MVP. It, that's why he's not in the conversation. The problem for John Morant and players like that, like like Chandler said, is we're in the era of truly gaudy stats and, and guys putting those up and winning games on top of that. And the MVP race has been kind of clear from day one. I mean, we have guys hopping in and out and – but, you know, unfortunately for Ja, who is entering his prime, he's dealing with five, six, seven guys that are in their prime right now and performing like that. And, and that's fine. He'll have his time. It just won't be this year. Yeah. And the only other guy that's in the hunt right now is Luca, whose team's not that great. Besides that, all these other guys are on real contenders and doing the same thing Ja's doing. So it's tough. It's funny. We just don't take the, it's like, we're not taking the Grizzlies seriously is what I'm hearing, which is interesting to me considering what's happening right now. But Eddie, did you just do the TV equivalent of a costume change? Like what just happened Ooh, here? I switched the <laughs> backdrop up. I got your bad backdrop what? grade. So I kind of, you Good know, Lord. turned around. It's all so, fancy. Fun again, so you're doing the show tomorrow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know, right? You just randomly pulled that up. All right, moving on. Uh, another fun fact. We have so many fun stats today in the show, but this, I think you guys will be happy because it's about the rookie, uh, Matherin. He's averaging 17 and a half points a game off the bench. Okay, that's the highest average for a player off the bench with a minimum of 30 games played. So... Uh, he's got to start the last few with Halliburton out. Eddie, you buying he should be a starter for this team? Did we lose Eddie? I'll oh, take Chandler, Eddie. take it away. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, Eddie's speech is <laughs> over. Eddie's speech is over, Matherin. Uh, listen, I think there's a method to Rick Carlisle's madness. I think he is a brilliant mind when it comes to offensive sets. There was a stat when I went and signed and played with him in Dallas that – Everybody who plays for Rick Carlisle their first year, their points per game skyrockets. And and this kid is now, he's coming off the bench. He's extremely talented. He's going against second strings most of the time. And he's comfortable and he's got that rhythm. Is he eventually going to be a starter? Yes. He's, you know, he's their first or second best player on the team. But I think the way Carlisle is kind of slowly working him in, keeping him off the bench, keeping him comfortable, keeping expectations low uh, in the beginning of his career, I think was smart. But y- you can't doubt it. The, the kid is a starter. The kid is a possible all-star one day. And, and he eventually he is going to end up in the starting line, especially on a team like Indiana. I can't wait to see if Eddie can hear us. Go. Yes. Talk. I, I, I don't think, I, I think he's perfect in the role he's in. Let him play against okay. backup units. Let, let, look, they have a starting backcourt. That's the unfortunate issue for him. And, and Rick Carlisle is going to go with his vets. And, you know, as, as much as we want to see him on the floor and on in that lineup, you know, his, his starting backcourt is a longtime veteran and a sniper. And a guy <laughs> in Tyrese Halliburton that's probably going to be in the All Star game, and people think he should start the All Star game. So, you know, Benny has his time coming, and 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 he closes games, which is important. So yeah. he'll, he'll he'll have his time, and he's just going to have to wait. He's, you know, uh, Buddy Hield is always in trade rumors. Maybe they'll they'll finally get rid of him, pull the trigger, and then Benedict Matherin can start after that. But I, I think he's exactly. He's fine where he's at, and he's a rookie of the year contender as well. Like, I don't. There's, there's got to be no chance anybody's ever won six man and rookie of the year in the same season, and he might be able to pull that off. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I, again, it's the finishing of the games. I think that's just so much more valuable. I don't know why we we worry about starting George Carl is one of my favorite follows on Twitter. He just likes to stir things up. He's been doing that for the last couple of weeks. Late, lately, he said that Michael Jordan would have averaged a 40-point triple-double in this league if he played today. Now, I just want to tell you this before, Chandler. The closest he got, 88-89. He averaged 32-8-8. Eight, and eight. Now, that I've said that, are you buying it? It's hard to argue only because, first of all, obviously we know how great of a scorer he was and the things he could do. In today's age, he would probably shoot 20 to 25 free throws a game, <laughs> which, which would bump his st- – his points per game, you know, close to 40. So uh, it's hard to argue, especially at the clip and the pace and the, how fast the league is now. Um, I'm assuming he would, you know, shoot more threes as well. But I think the biggest thing is just the physicality of back in the day. Half the times he wasn't even getting to the stripe. Nowadays, he would live at the free throw line where, where he's going to knock down a high clip. So it's, it's hard to argue against that. He would he would be putting up a lot of gaudy numbers that the guys are today. You know what, Shams? You're the youngest one on this panel. So when the rest of us talk about Michael Jordan as much as we do and as glowingly as we do, what what is your initial reaction? I mean, you're also in Chicago, well, so it's Michelle, kind of an interesting I, perspective. I, yeah, so I, I'm I'm a Chicago guy, so I'm I'm partial to Michael Jordan anyway. Even though I didn't see his prime, I didn't see him play in the '90s, so I can't even say that you know. Oh yeah, I watched this moment; it was like transcendent. So it's tough <laughs> for me. I was four years old when he won his uh, the '98 championship. Oh. But what I will say is, when I see the clips, when I see the tape, and you see the way, like Chandler said, defenses. Are, are, it, it's an offensive league now. The, the league is positioned for scores, for high numbers, for high stats. And there's no doubt, like, the numbers Michael Jordan put up, 36 uh, and 5, that would have been, you kind of multiply it by two. I, I don't think he'd average 60 a game, but definitely the rebounds, the assists. There's more rebounds to be had. There's more assists. There's probably a little bit more focus and, and attention to detail to being a more well-rounded player uh, now th- than even before as, as far as statistically. So, yeah, I think I think... Would he average a triple-double? I I think so. 
I don't even know if Eddie, do you want to chime in at all or just give us your face? <laughs> my connection is so iffy. I mean, <laughs> just Mike, go for would it. Be, Mike would have gaudy numbers, of course. I mean, he's Michael Jordan, 40 point triple double. I mean, like, where do you find the situations <laughs> to do that? He's that great. He could pull it off. I mean, I, I could see it, but the fact that we haven't seen it yet and guys are clearly gunning for that, you know, it makes me a little more reserved. They'll just double him. They, they couldn't hard double like that back then. They would just double him. And that would be all the difference in my eyes. <laughs> Am What's I on, are we all drunk today? Like this, what is, yeah, is this show yeah. real? Is this a rehearsal? Are we on the air? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but we're going to take a quick break. Uh, and when we come back, something will be said out loud and some pictures will be on the screen. What those things will be. I have no idea. <laughs> Welcome back. We've got to talk a little uh, suspension time here. Houston Rockets guard Jalen Green and forward Jay Sean Tate both suspended a game because they left the bench during an altercation with the Kings. Uh, this was fourth quarter on Friday. Garrison Matthews fouling Malik Monk. Then there's a just a scuffle and some fun and some shuffling going on there. But it's it's weird because they appear to be actually trying to break this thing up. We get why the rule's in place, right, Chandler? But do we like the rule, given how it's being enforced here? Yeah, I, I, I get it, because most times I feel like guys are coming off the bench to kind of protect and defend their brother and their teammate out there, and usually that's going to escalate the situation. This was a rare example where they were actually just kind of trying to break it up, and they weren't trying to fight anybody. And yeah, this, was, this wasn't a lot. This was pretty petty. No one... <laughs> most of these things are fluff and, and you know nothing's gonna happen and but i get the rule i mean i, I, I it kind of protects everybody in a way and just kind of keeps things under control but this was just a tough break because they really didn't do anything wrong they were just trying to help right plus they can't afford to have guys not play come on this seems silly yeah, well, I, I, I think part of this is on the coaches too, though, right? Like this is on the coaches to make sure that Jay Sean Tate and Jalen Green aren't getting to the bench area. You saw what the Kings coaches, they were up and like they got their guys. It wasn't the same with the Houston guys. So I'm not trying to put blame, but that's usually where it goes in these situations. <laughs> yeah, look, if if Amari Stoudemire is going to miss an important playoff game and, and kind of change the course of history because of this weird rule, they're not going to change it over Jalen Green and Jason Tate. Uh, <laughs> and that was like a toe on the line on the court. These guys ran on the court. I mean, you know the rule. Just like Chams is saying, the coaches know the rule. Uh, just don't do it. There wasn't a fight. It was it was like a dumb thing. And, and you guys are down 20. Like, whatever. But also true. stupid rule. We know that. But like most stupid oh! rules that we have right now, we have the Pistons and Pacers to blame for that. You know what? Eddie looks better Eddie like today. that. You know, he he just looks better. He just looks better when, <laughs> just, when his face is paused. So I think, just I think frozen. the Zoom guys are looking out for us. <laughs> Shams, thank you, uh, as always, for hanging out, especially long today. We'll see you tomorrow. When we come back. Oh, our parlays are straight garbage. Uh, if it smells like a fish, I guess it is a fish. We'll do there more when we get back. Every day wins. Make your day so much better. That's why FanDuel Casino has a daily free to play game. Reward Machine is a free game that gives players the chance to win up to $2,000 in casino bonus every day. FanDuel's Reward Machine has already given away over 10 million in prizes and has over 250,000 winners. To get in on the action, all you have to do is log in daily and spin for a free chance at rewards. FanDuel wants you to win. Play Reward Machine for a free chance at everyday wins only on Fan Duel Casino. Well, some of the greatest have fallen, fallen hard, and that looks like what's going on here right now. This is a second one in a row of just straight, big, fat, red L's. Gentlemen, uh, I, I mean, I'm taking a moral victory in that my loss was the closest of the three. I mean, do we get points for that? <laughs> The sad part is I really, really love those picks. Like I thought those were some of our, those were some of our better picks. That is the sad part, Chandler. <laughs> that's, that's why we're so great at this so far. Okay. I mean, we were like, as the games kept going, I was just like, man, we are not good, but I, it's okay. We are now on an ugly, ugly mini streak. But sometimes that's what you need to get better. Is that right? Okay, great. We have another chance today, Eddie. Um, let's start with you. 
I, I'm going with the home team, Nick Claxton playing against Ooh. your Spurs. Um, yeah, somebody yeah. has to get some of these extra points with Kevin out. Uh, he had a point. great game against the Thunder. He's already had a great game against the Spurs this season. So I'm going with the over for him, 14 and a half points. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is the turnaround because the Spurs are that bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? When is his signal going to go out again? Is that happening soon? Or <laughs> Chandler, what do you have? <laughs> uh, what do I have? I have Anthony Simons over 20 and a half points. Uh, listen, he averages more than that, and he's playing Denver, who's not very good defensively. Uh, so when you combine those two facts, he should have over <laughs> one and a half points. <laughs> okay, why, why can't we get through this without laughing? Because we're awful. That's why we can't. Um, I just went straight Clippers money line. I'm That's gonna. I feel like. <laughs> no, you just I just feel right. like. <laughs> I need a fresh start. I need to like <laughs> zap some energy to this. Um, okay, Eddie, first of all, number one, don't think I didn't notice that you just skipped coming to San Antonio and went straight to the West Coast. That's fine. We could talk about that uh, privately offline. Secondly, would you like to make a friendly wager on tonight's game? Well, oh my God, I'm just gonna at <laughs> I think that's a hard no. You know what, Chandler? That You know what this means? You get to take his wager and give it to me. What would you like you Eddie to what? wager me? I, I like the Sixers over the Clippers, Michelle. So, what? so that's, I also Are you serious? don't like the only one I like tonight is mine. If I'm being complete. <laughs> I, the, okay. And money lines are usually the safe pick, but yeah. I'm, I mean, I like the Sixers. The Sixers are, are finding their steam right now. Nick, we're betting on Nick Claxton to have 15 points. That's where we are. Yeah, well, we're I mean, I, on, I do get the we're logic on of two him. days of how long has James Harden been in LA? We're betting on that. Are, are we? That's yeah, a some great of best, point. Some of some of guys' best games are when they're hungover and drunk, Getty. <laughs> that's where we're starting that. the show tomorrow. <laughs> Eddie, would you like to make a wager on tonight? Because anything could happen. Just a friendly wager between besties and their teams. <laughs> oh, if we, uh, oh yeah, let's make one. Um, okay. You use Loser. my Wi-Fi tomorrow if the Nets win. Hell no. Actually, that's fine. <laughs> I just take the night off and her day off and like call it a day. No, I think the loser gets a tattoo of the winner's choice. That's an easy one to make every single time. <laughs> I'm down. I got a lot of tats. I'm down. <laughs> Me too. I'm in. Are Chandler, <laughs> how are you contributing? I think I'm losing service right now. I can't hear you guys. <laughs> Man, if there are awards given out for shows that barely got through and on the air, then we just won the grand dame of them all. And I'd like to say that, by the way, it's if there's smoke, there's fire, or if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. That fish thing that you said, Chandler, hot ass mess, hot ass mess. That's going to do it for us today. We're going to see you guys tomorrow. Hopefully. Have a good one. <laughs>